The stock market threw another major sale here today. This was the worst day since, let me check my notes, Friday. Uh, while that doesn't sound so bad, we did have a 2% pullback in the S&P 500 today. And from a market breadth perspective, I do believe today was worse than Friday. So while the percentages didn't necessarily suggest that because we did have a couple of mega st uh, cap stocks close in the green, uh, just the typical stock did do worse here today. So there was uh, definitely some pain felt on Wall Street as we closed out the month of November. And as we head into December, a lot of times we talk about that Santa Claus rally, uh, but perhaps this is a year where the Grinch shows up instead. So we'll take a look at all of our charts, see what it means for our posture, which of course getting a bit more bearish here recently. Uh, and then we'll get into our trade application example at the end of the video, where I wanted to take advantage of a beat down in a certain stock by selling a put on it to try to acquire it at a much more attractive price out in January. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by marketscholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's November 30th, 2021. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below and sign up for our email distribution list in the description area. Uh, typically on our emails, when we send them out to let you know that the videos are available for you to view, at the bottom of the email, you'll see uh, the stocks that are giving you overbought and oversold cluster signals within the S&P 500. As a bonus for you here today, I'm going to include uh, monthly clusters, which are incredibly rare, but considering we basically closed right at the lows uh, here today, uh, we actually did have three oversold cluster signals on a monthly candle chart in the S&P 500. Some of you that uh, will think hard enough might know one of them, but you might be surprised by the other two. So I'll leave that in there as an Easter egg for those of you uh, that are already part of our email distribution list to check out here uh, later tonight, in addition to the daily clusters that we always send out. Uh, in addition to YouTube, we're also heavy users of Twitter. My handle is at Brandon Van Z. If you're not following me already, I would encourage you to do so. We really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these Market Outlook related videos. Remember, we don't make any money doing these videos, even though we spend about three hours of our day doing that. Uh, of course, we do make money on our premium side of our business. So all of you that are our premium members, we thank you for that. You are effectively subsidizing everybody else who is not a premium member. So without having a premium side of our business, we would, of course, not be able to offer a free product like this as often as we do. So thank you to all of you who have been our premium members for the last several years. And thank you to those of you that just signed up here over the weekend with our Black Friday sale, which, by the way, expires here tonight for those of you that are trying to take advantage of that last minute opportunity for 20% off our premium services. In addition to Twitter, we also have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to check out our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and get into it here today. Before we get started, speaking of that Black Friday slash Cyber Monday sale that we are offering, as I mentioned a moment ago, it does expire tonight at midnight. So depending upon when you're watching this video, if you're watching it here on uh, Tuesday afternoon slash evening, you have a few hours left to take advantage of our 20% off on our three-year premium package. And uh, here are the classes that uh, David and I teach to our premium members, which of course are the priority uh, over our free product that we offer. So for those of you that want more content and want to make sure that it's done consistently, you will find that with our premium program, whereas we can't always guarantee that with, of course, this free product that we don't get paid from. Uh, so our trading rooms that we uh, teach throughout the week, remember, we work six out of the seven days for you because David is nice enough to do his question and answer session on Saturday mornings in addition to us doing our normal classes Monday through Friday. So top-down trend trading uh, is one of the classes. In fact, we just bought Apple yesterday, and we'll talk about Apple here in just a little bit. It was one of only seven stocks in the S&P 500 that closed higher today. So well done to all of you that voted for Apple yesterday in class. Whether you knew it or not, that was a brilliant stroke. Uh, we also have had quite the success in our options for long-term investors trading room where we've won over 100 trades in a row. 
which stretches back about a year and a half. Uh, we do have a couple of trades in jeopardy right now, so we'll see if that will end uh, this month, but we've had a very good string of success there as we have in a lot of our other classes. I also teach dividend growth investing. I taught that class earlier today where we concentrated on the consumer staples sector, of course, a little bit more of a mundane risk off type of the sector where we're looking for those stocks that have long histories of growing their dividends. David teaches his directional options strategies class on Tuesdays as well. Uh, I teach my factor-based swing trading class on Wednesdays. Uh, David teaches his options inventory trading class on Wednesdays. Uh, he teaches his portfolio management with ETFs class on Thursdays and then technical analysis there on Fridays in addition to the Q&A classes that each of us teach throughout the week. So lots of great stuff there. Uh, so this is the last you have to hear of it because the deal does expire tonight. Uh, but for those of you that do want to take advantage of that, we do have a uh, red band up at the top of our website. There's a little orange button there. And if you right click on it, or even just regular click on it. I'm just gonna right click and open it up in a new tab. It'll go to that area of our website. And the key to getting this 20% off is when you're filling out your information, come to this area that says have a coupon, click on it, and then type out Black Friday, all one word, with the B and the F capitalized. And then um, once you've clicked, I've read and agreed to the terms of service. Uh, you can then click subscribe for premium access down below. And before you type in any credit card information there, uh, it will show you uh, what that 20% amount is. So uh, anyway, take advantage of that if you're getting this uh, late here on a Tuesday night because this is your last hurrah and then you guys don't have to hear us talking about it again. Remember, we only offer this sale once per year so you'll go another uh, year without having to hear us uh, talk about our premium offerings there that once again do subsidize all of these free videos that we give you throughout the rest of the uh, year here on YouTube. And thank you to those of you that have already signed up. I've enjoyed getting to know many of you just over the last couple of days from the new crop uh, over the weekend. All right. Uh, while we're over here, I also wanted to show you here real quick on Twitter some of the content that we've been producing here lately. Remember, David and I are both heavy users of Twitter, so if you're interested in our thoughts on the market, we would encourage you to follow us there throughout the day. Um, first of all, thank you to the 86 people who clicked like for me the last time around when I did this market outlook video. I'd like to get that number a little closer to 100 if we could help it. Again, it does take a long time to do these videos, and so uh, if we're up and over 100, uh, I'll make sure I make it a priority. If we're under 100, then I'll just have to check to see what my schedule looks like that day. But as I mentioned before, I'll always be teaching my uh, premium uh, members earlier in the day. Um, I wanted to focus on this graphic here as well. I kind of hinted at this already, but uh, I mentioned here on Twitter that this is one of the worst market breadth days I can recall in a long time. Less than 2% of the stocks in the S&P 500 closed in the green. You can literally count those on just two hands. Here you can see which stocks those were. Apple, as I mentioned before, had a great day. It was actually up 3%. Uh, if Apple wasn't up 3%, our market indices would have looked even worse because remember, Apple is one of the most influential members of the, uh, of the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite due to its large market cap. Pfizer also had a very good day. Merck uh, kind of had a nice rally towards the end of the day. Merck did raise their dividend earlier today in addition to getting uh, some approvals on their drugs. Uh, we do have uh, Tesla also in the green today. Of course, that's been a hot stock all year long. Uh, Dent Supply Serona, so a dental supply company, ticker symbol X-Ray was up today. IPGP, which is a uh, laser uh, company, was up today. And then BioLab. Uh, our BioRad Laboratories, a life sciences and tools company was also up, but that's it. Out of 500 plus stocks in the S&P 500, if you include the multiple share classes of some of them, only seven closed in the green. Uh, that is one of the biggest wipeouts we've seen in quite some time. Again, the, um, the actual 
uh, number, uh, our percentage pullback was only about 2%, which was not worse than what we experienced the day after Thanksgiving last week. But a big chunk of the reason behind that is because Apple was up 3% today. From a market breadth perspective, this was awful. Less than 2% of stocks closing in the green. Also, a few other things to be aware of. If you're in a dividend investor, you might be uh, um, interested to note that uh, McCormick, the spices company, which is a dividend aristocrat, did raise their dividend for the 36th straight year. We also had MasterCard raising their dividend earlier uh, in the day. I also posted about the dividend aristocrat list and how it, it's extremely rare to find that all 65 dividend aristocrats close lower on the same day, and that is what happened here today. Usually there's one or two that close in the green because of course uh, it has all 11 sectors accounted for, and usually these are some of the quote unquote safer stocks. Uh, but today you didn't really seek too much safety out of any list, regardless of where you were trying to look for in the market with only seven stocks in the S&P 500 up. And then as I mentioned before, Merck was also higher here today, uh, part of that due to their increase of their dividend. So lots of great content there uh, that David and I do our best to share with you uh, throughout the day. I'm going to try to get on uh, that, the train a little bit more in terms of sharing content. Uh, some of you might know that I've been fostering a puppy for the last uh, two or three weeks. Unfortunately, today was our final day of fostering him, so I've had my hands full with uh, bite marks and uh, getting him out to the, the yard to go to the bathroom and making sure he's not chewing on my couches and all kinds of things going on. Uh, so now I'll kind of get back to my normal uh, view. It's a little sad to see him go without a doubt, but uh, where there's one hole in the heart, another one gets filled in as we've had a lot of new students joining us here at Market Scholar. So it'll be great to get to know you guys uh, as well going forward. Let's go ahead and get into some more of the market action here today. Here's a slightly different way to view the market breadth. And as you can see, it was a wipeout. It was a bloodshed type of a day. Um, remember how you view this heat map here. This is the S&P 500. So there's about 500 uh, components here that you're looking at. And the larger the squares or rectangles, the bigger the market caps and more influential those companies are on the overall index. And as you can see, one stands out like a sore thumb and that's that green apple that you see over there. Thank goodness it wasn't a red apple today. It was a green apple up 3%. Again, happy to see that we at least uh, got one nice one out of our top-down trend trading class that we purchased just yesterday. Uh, Tesla, another big component there was up just a hair today. And then there, there's Pfizer, another one of our top-down trend trading uh, holdings from that class up 2.5% today. But other than those three nice green rectangles there, it looks like a sea of red out there. Some really ugly price action. Into it stands out. That stock actually looked pretty good as recently as yesterday, and it just wiped out 6% today. Salesforce was down about 4% in the regular session today. Be aware that they just reported their earnings after the bell tonight, and unfortunately, they're selling off even harder after hours. So that doesn't necessarily bode well for the tech-heavy indices out there starting tomorrow morning. And you know, on days like this, a lot of times you can maybe feel a little bit more comfortable in your consumer staples and your utilities and your REITs and maybe some healthcare stocks, but we just didn't have that today. Uh, no matter where you were trying to hunker down, you were likely uh, suffering some extreme pain uh, across the board in your portfolio here today. So tough day for market participants, myself included, right? Uh, we're, we're all feeling the pain after a day like today. So we'll see where things take us. But without a doubt, our postures are starting to become a bit weaker than we would prefer. Remember, another way that we can kind of digest some of this data is by uh, also looking at um, this chart 6D. Remember, this chart 6D is one of 50 plus charts that we offer our premium members. Uh, if you do use the Thinkorswim platform, they're customized charts that we build with 
uh, programming language known as ThinkScript. Anyway, um, this particular chart is designed to kind of help us visualize how often we get days like this. And as I mentioned here in the intro, we actually just had a worse day than this from a percentage basis on Friday. Now, other than that, it's, you know, you'd have to go back to this other day back here at the end of September. Uh, we were down just over 2% on that day. Remember this orange tag right here says 2% price move. So like on this day over here, it means that the stock market was down 2%. Back over here on uh, March 1st, the stock market was up 2% because the orange line is, is up on top with the green bars. So the red bars are sell-off days, uh, the green bars are, uh, are stock market up days, and uh, it gives us an opportunity to see how volatile price action has been lately because we've had three days in a row here of way above average type of movement. We had a washout there on Black Friday. We followed that up with trading on Monday where we had a nice solid rebound out of the gate and then of course falling right back down here today. So the last three days in particular have been wild uh, trading action that we've seen there. And so, um, you know, you don't like to see those red, um, you know, bars that are kind of pushing lower, all clustering together. You start getting a little bit more nervous that, you know, the, the wheels are coming off the bus, so to speak. So uh, we'll see where that takes us. Another thing that you can kind of examine is down below, this is effectively your VIX. And the VIX is back up to about 27 already. Um, remember, we've spent much of the last 10 years with a VIX at around 20 or lower. So uh, you do have some fair, you, 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 have, you have some you know, exceptions to that, of course, with the coronavirus lows and things like that. But generally speaking, um, you've been seeing the VIX at 20 or less, meaning that volatility has not been extreme. So uh, by reading this right now at 27, uh, that is showing you that volatility is getting a, a little bit more extreme again. Another way to pull it up, of course, would just be to pull up VIX here, and you can kind of see what that looks like. Let me see if I can get this, um, this study off of here real quick. There we go. Um, you can see here that the VIX is up here at 27 all of a sudden. Remember, just a month ago, we were down here at 16. And to put this into context, the last time we were kind of up in these levels consistently uh, was probably back here in May. You had one day with a long upper shadow there in, in, um, in uh, it looks like it was mid to late September, but we didn't close near the highs of the session. So um, what, we've ex what we've seen here in the last two out of the three days that we've had recently is the VIX closing up here at 27 or higher, and that has not happened since going all the way back here to May. And even that was just one day. Uh, last time we've kind of clustered up at 27 or above on the VIX, you'd have to go back here to that March time period. So not quite a year ago, but about nine months ago or thereabouts. So for those of you that are newer to the stock market, if this has felt a little bit uncomfortable here the last uh, few days, uh, there's good reason behind that. These are not normal sessions uh, that we are uh, you know, wading through at this moment in time. Uh, they've been definitely much more uh, dangerous waters, I guess you could say, and volatility has erupted higher uh, because market participants are becoming more fearful and they want to protect their portfolios by buying uh, puts or doing other things like selling futures contracts. That's one thing that uh, David Settle does a really good job of teaching his students within our premium program how to trade futures in order to hedge the rest of their portfolio. So make sure you're taking advantage of his knowledge there uh, as well. Let's go ahead and take a look here at our market watch tab. This is another way to kind of visualize how difficult trading was here today. I've got the S&P 500 pulled up on our index watch and here's what I was referencing before. Seven stocks in the S&P 500 closed higher. Now, if you're including the multiple share classes out there, 497 stocks closed lower. Look at all that red. I mean, you got that lucky one with Apple right there. Other than that, you are talking about red, 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 red. This was a bloody day across the board. And keep in mind that this is traditionally 
a bullish time of year, right? The November, December, January time period from a seasonality perspective tends to be your strongest three month period during the year. So it makes it particularly strange to see this uh, market kind of fall in apart here all of a sudden. Part of the reason behind that might have been because of the extremely strong October that we had, which is also a little bit rare from a seasonality perspective. So it's possible we kind of uh, earned our Santa Claus rally uh, a month or two earlier than we normally would have. And now we're kind of seeing the, the after effects of that. So it's going to be interesting to see how things shake out as we head towards that Christmas time period. Remember, I think it was back in 2018, we had a really ugly week of Christmas and Christmas Eve there as well. So it's not that it can't happen. It's just that it's fairly rare for that to be the case. And maybe we have another uh, one of those uh, types of markets that we're dealing with here uh, all of the sudden. Let's go ahead and come on over here now to our charts and do uh, chart 4B and this will be our market forecast for grid. And this will give us a sense as to what our posture is using the market forecast technical indicator. Now remember, there are literally hundreds of technical indicators out there. The market forecast is just one of them, but it is kind of uh, representative of the core of what we try to teach you in these free complimentary YouTube videos here on a regular basis. And so um, it is something that's available on the Thinkorswim platform. We've kind of uh, you know, done some of the um, you know, aesthetic work here through our programming uh, with these particular customized charts. But those of you that are just regular users of Thinkorswim, you can find the basic market forecast indicator on your platform as well. Uh, but the way you read this is by looking at the green line underneath each of these charts and asking yourself where is it positioned and which direction is it heading. You can see that we've color coded the backgrounds here through the automated programming code I mentioned before of ThinkScript to tell us when we have a bullish versus a bearish posture. That green line is also referred to as the intermediate line. So we're looking at a four grid here with the S&P 500 in the upper left where we were down 1.9% today. This was an important day because while it was not as big of a drop on a percentage basis as what we saw on Friday, we breached those lows, right? So from a technical analysis perspective, we have now broken that potential support right there. Not only that, but we were feeling maybe a little bit better about our situation just yesterday as we were back above a rising moving average and then wham, one day later, pull the rug out once again and we are now trading well below uh, that moving average. In fact, the vast majority of stocks out there are trading at least 10% off of their recent highs according to some of the information I saw on Twitter earlier today. Now with that big pullback there, you'll notice that that green line has fallen out of what we refer to as the upper reversal zone. And that's on, uh, on the market forecast, that's above 80. The lower reversal zone is below uh, 20 right there. So when that green line is in the upper reversal zone, uh, regardless of whether it's rising or falling, we consider that to be a bullish posture. And you can see here for the last couple of months, we've mostly had a bullish posture on the S&P 500, which is why this information we're sharing with you the last couple of days is new. And so uh, you're going to want to sit up and pay attention because there are changes afoot within the marketplace. We now have a bearish intermediate posture. Remember, intermediate refers to a time frame. Intermediate time frame generally refers to, let's call it a two to three month time period. So it doesn't necessarily have to mean that we're going into a long term bear market. It just means that for the next couple of months, we've got to be a little bit more mindful of the risk that we're taking, perhaps uh, taking smaller position sizes, perhaps hedging our portfolios a bit more, perhaps adding more bearish trades to what we're already doing. So there's a number of ways that you can go about that process. But for the first time since back here in um, late September, we now have a bearish posture again. The good news is we just consider it weakly bearish on the S&P 500, not strongly bearish. That's because the green line has slipped out of the upper reversal zone and is now traveling lower, but has not yet crossed the 50th percentile. Now that's on the S&P 500. Let's talk about the Dow Jones Industrial Average now, because here you can see an example of that dark pink background color on its chart. 
Notice that its green line has already breached that 50th percentile on the market forecast, and therefore we've gone from weakly bearish to strongly bearish. Now remember, we've already gone to bearish on the Dow Jones since back here on November 18th. So it's a little different than the S&P 500, which just went bearish yesterday. The S&P 500 was doing its best to hang on for dear life. It's finally giving up the ghost now. You know, on a day when only seven out of 500 plus stocks is higher, uh, you can understand why. But prior to that, it was actually doing pretty well, all things considered. The Dow Jones, not so much. And you could say the same thing with down below with the Russell 2000. Those two charts look somewhat similar in that they went to a weekly bearish posture you know, a few weeks ago. Whereas the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite over here on the left-hand side, uh, those just recently went to bearish postures in the last three days. So if you're to think about that from a high-level perspective, it basically is telling you that our biggest laggards in the market are the, the mega caps in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Think about a stock like Visa who, that's just been trampled on here recently. And then also the Russell 2000, which are your 2000 small caps here, particularly in the United States. Those two kind of bookends, the mega caps and the small caps, are the laggards in this market to the downside, whereas your big tech companies like your Apples and your Microsofts have been able to hold up a little bit better, and therefore the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite um, haven't seen as much wear and tear on their charts yet. But again, I need to stress, the S&P 500 does not look very good here. We closed near the lows of the session, down about 2% here today, 1.9% to be exact, but we did breach the lows from Friday. The NASDAQ composite looks a little bit different where we did have a big sell-off day here, right? We were down 1.55% here today in the uh, NASDAQ composite as well, but notice it was able to maintain a trading range above uh, Friday's lows. So maybe just a glimmer of hope there out of the large cap tech index. Um, but you know, given what we see on all of these other charts, I'm not sure how much I trust that right now, right? Uh, when you have uh, such strong market breadth to the downside like we did today, and you're seeing that not only in the S&P 500, but in, a, in, a, in 2,000 stocks of the, the small caps, um, you know, you're going to have quite the battle in front of you if you're just a handful of the mega cap tech stocks that's trying to keep this whole market propped up the way that they have in the last month or so. So, you know, brace yourself. These charts have gotten decidedly more bearish. All of them are considered bearish at this moment in time. The S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite are considered weakly bearish. The Dow Jones Industrial Average and Russell 2000 are considered strongly bearish. Not only that, but notice the Dow Jones Industrial Average and Russell 2000 also have red moving averages. Those are 30 day, 30 day moving averages. And what that signifies is prices below a falling moving average. Notice the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite are also trading below their 30-day moving averages, but the moving averages themselves are still rising. So that's why the tips of them are yellow in those cases. So another way for us to determine that indeed it is the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Russell 2000 that are our true laggards in this market. In fact, you're getting to the point where you almost have an oversold cluster signal on the Russell 2000, and it's been more than three months since we can make that claim. So uh, I have a feeling we're gonna see a lot of daily clusters in the um, email that I send you uh, that's associated with this video tonight within the S&P 500. And as I mentioned earlier, we even have three, with this being the last day of November, we have three confirmed oversold cluster signals uh, on monthly candle charts. So there are some um, chaotic things happening underneath the surface, even if Apple and Microsoft and some of these mega caps are kind of masking that to a degree from the index level view. From a three green arrows perspective, I'm sure we probably have three red arrows across the board, but let's just go ahead and verify that here on chart 4D. And indeed that is the case. Now, somewhat surprisingly to me, uh, we just got the three red arrow signal on uh, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite. And I guess the reason behind that is because they had that big update yesterday. So the green arrow on the moving average pop, 
uh, pop back in there. But one day later, we're back to the three red arrow status that we were at on Friday on each of those. Whereas the Dow Jones Industrial Average, Russell 2000, they've been in three red arrow status for the better part of the last uh, you know, one or two weeks. So it's not all that new to see that. But uh, with these other uh, areas like the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite, that's a bit newer. Now, remember, we've had this transition period. So it's not like this should be hitting you out of the blue and you should be shocked by this. Remember, we had one of the longer periods of three green arrow status from uh, mid-October to um, you know the first or second week of November. Then we transitioned into this white area where we had a mix of green and red area arrows. And now we're starting to transition into that more three red arrow heavy focus there. So uh, we got a little bit ahead of our skis during this moment in time. We got way above those moving averages to a point where we were starting to hit different standard deviation levels. Uh, and now we're kind of paying the price for getting a little overheated at that time. So three red arrows across the board, not a tremendous surprise on that count. Let's do some 12 grid analysis now, starting with chart 5A. This is our asset class 12 grid. The background colors of these charts will tell you whether our intermediate posture on the market forecast is bullish or bearish. If the charts are pink, uh, they're bearish postures. If the charts are green, they're bullish postures. So maybe let's start our conversation today with the um, the green charts, since they're in the minority here today, there's only three of them on the board. And you're probably not surprised to learn that those three charts are more conservative asset classes. You have the US dollar in the lower left-hand corner. It was actually down today, by the way. It was down uh, about a half a percent, which is a pretty decent give back day for the US dollar. But because it's been so strong for the last two or three weeks, it was able to retain its strongly bullish posture. Now above that, you will see uh, the long-term US treasuries. So remember, those are government bonds here in the United States. A lot of times when there's fear in the system, people leave the stock market and go into where it perceives safety. And of course, as long as the government doesn't default, they're gonna be able to um, you know, pay their interest payments along the way and give you your money back when their uh, bonds expire or mature, I should say. And so you do see that behavior quite regularly. Even if you go back in 2008 and 2009, when the stock market was collapsing, you'll see that TLT actually did very well in those years. So uh, that's a fairly traditional rotation that we see when markets get fearful as they were today. So we had a big rally in TLT today. It was up 1.52%. You can see that that is effectively near a three month high. We did have a slightly higher candle back here on September 22nd, uh, but other than that candle, today was the highest close for TLT in the last three months. So of course we have a strongly bullish posture and we are trading above that rising 30 day moving average. You'll also see that foreign bonds, while not nearly as spectacular as the US government bonds, also did reasonably well today. Foreign bonds were up 0.3% and they are now above a rising 30 day moving average there as well. That uh, dark green background color tells us that we have that strongly bullish posture. So that's it. Those three are our bullish charts. All the rest are bearish. Now, it's worth pointing out that high yield bonds did not participate alongside other bonds today. And as you guys have heard me mention repeatedly throughout the years, if you've watched this video for any amount of time, you have found that high yield bonds have a fairly high correlation these days to oil prices. Remember, high yield bonds are effectively corporate bonds, um, so it's money issued or raised by corporations that desperately need the money because they can't finance it in more conservative ways at cheaper um, interest rates. So they need to raise you know, uh, money in the high yield or junk bond market. And a lot of those companies that have suffered in recent years are companies in the oil patch where business has not been booming for the most part. And so oil prices have really been collapsing here over the last week. It's a little bit of a surprise. Remember how strong oil was just a month ago. Now all of a sudden oil is looking at a three month low. It literally touched a three month low today, according to USO that we use as our proxy here for that. So boy, oh boy, when the tide turns, it can hurt mightily. And this is, a, of course, a very cyclical asset class, what we're dealing with with oil. It was down 4.5% today. And remember the billions upon billions of dollars sloshing around in that particular commodity around the world. So a 4.5% move uh, is a big time move in that particular commodity. So with oil prices collapsing to the downside, 
a lot of those corporations that were on the brink and having to you know issue high yield debt they have been struggling here as well so high yield bonds actually closed 0.42% lower today when their cousins in the foreign bond market and the US government bond market uh, were a bastion of safety. Speaking of commodities, you can see that gold had a pretty big sell off today as well. Not nearly as big as oil on a percentage basis. It was only down 0.67%, but you will see it was a pretty erratic and ugly looking uh, candle that we have here. In fact, this is the fifth Actually, I take that back. Let me just count real quick. I'm gonna right click on this miniature chart here. So a tip for those of you that are newer premium members that have already gone through the download process of our charts. When you're working with our 12 grids like this, if you right click on them and then go to maximize cell, you can then see the, the, the full screen view here. And that can be helpful in a case like what I'm trying to do here, which is count how many days in a row gold has been down. And you can see that that stretches back to this last candle. You can see that that candle was outlined in black, meaning it was up that day. But every other outline is in red here on these uh, other candles. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days in a row to the downside for gold. Today was kind of the goofiest looking candle of all of those eight days because for a brief moment in time, it looked like gold was gonna benefit from the chaotic trading. And that does happen occasionally as well, right? Sometimes money drifts towards not only US government bonds and the US dollar, but sometimes it goes into hard assets like a gold as kind of an alternative asset class away from paper assets like stocks. And at the beginning of today's trading session, it looks like that's where the market wanted to go. But because the pressure has been so strong here, uh, the selling pressure has been so strong, it eventually gave way and that buying turned into selling once again. And we actually closed near the lows of the session. Now, as I mentioned in the video last week, this would be kind of an interesting one for an iron condor setup. Even after today's uh, you know, sell-off, it still, I think, is in that vicinity where you're still in the middle of the trading range over the last three months with this being the low over here, this being the high up here, and us trading somewhat in the middle of that range. And with increased volatility here all of a sudden, you could probably get better premiums for selling iron condors uh, on gold and a lot of other things right now with the VIX being as high as it is uh, and probably be able to stretch those break evens a lot higher than that old uh, resistance area and a lot lower than that old support area there. So maybe a, a, a quick trade idea for some of you uh, interested in that type of a philosophy. Bitcoin has been kind of holding the low here the last 24 hours or so, so nothing new to report there. It continues to trade below its falling 30-day moving average and continues to have a strongly bearish posture, but it didn't get uh, tremendously worse here today, so that's the good news on that point, uh, part, I suppose. And then when it comes to the stock markets around the globe, be aware that the emerging markets actually outperformed U.S. markets and their cousins in the developed foreign stock market world. So EEM was only only down 0.1% today, and uh, EFA was down 0.88% today. Both of those outperformed the US market, but you'll notice that's just for one day. The background colors of those charts being that dark shade of pink, and the US market still being that light uh, shading of pink tell us that um, in recent intermediate time periods, those foreign markets have been worse. Uh, whether the United States plays catch up to the downside or not remains to be seen. One thing I will point out about EEM is just yesterday you had an oversold cluster signal there. Again, if I right click on the chart and I go to maximize, you can see how that uh, market forecast technical indicator is showing us that information where the blue line, the red line, and the green line are all in the lower reversal zone on the same day, producing that green dot down below there and also on the price chart up above, telling us that the selling has gotten a bit too extreme and perhaps it's due for a little bit of a short-term rally or at least um, kind of um, stopping the bleeding. And that is kind of what we saw here today, right? EEM normally on a day like today would be considered a riskier asset and you would expect it to go down even further than other types of markets. But here today, it was actually a little bit of a safe haven. It was only down 0.1%, but it does continue to have that strongly bearish posture. Let's go ahead and now take a look here at another 12 grid. This will be our our sector is 12 grid. This is uh, chart 5C for those of you following along at home. Notice that we have pink 
or uh, reddish charts across the board, basically telling us that all 11 sectors, at least from a market cap perspective, market cap weighted perspective, uh, now have bearish postures. That's a bit of a change. A week ago, that certainly wasn't the case. We had a few pink charts, but we also had some 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 green ones across the board, right? We had uh, technology that was doing reasonably well at that time. We had discretionary that was doing reasonably well. Even consumer staples were kind of getting up there near their three-month highs. Look at how things have changed. Technology and discretionary maybe held up a little bit better than um, might have been obvious at first blush, but that goes back to what I'd mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Apple, of course, is one of the most influential members of XLK. With it being up today, it kind of allowed it to kind of soak up the losses of a lot of the um, smaller market cap companies within XLK. And the same thing with Tesla. Tesla was one of the seven stocks up today. It's part of the discretionary uh, ETF, and it soaked up a lot of the smaller discretionary stocks losses. Consumer staples didn't offer such an opportunity. Um, uh, those big, um, you know, tech stocks like a Tesla or a um, uh, or an Apple. Tesla is technically discretionary, but it's oftentimes lumped in with technology-oriented themes. Um, anyway, um, with those two companies being up, that didn't do any favors at all for consumer staples. Uh, that was part of the appeal of us reviewing the consumer staples in my dividend growth investing class earlier today for my premium members because we went shopping. We were looking for uh, discounts here today, and hopefully we, we may have found some. But uh, this really uh, got hit hard, right? The the staples were down two and a half percent. Normally, they're they're an area you go uh, for safety on a day like today, right? It's usually the more cyclical areas that are just getting hammered, and you might find that the the staples are down, you know, a little bit less than a percent. Today, the consumer staples sold off just as hard, if not worse, than everything else. And boy, oh boy, did you slash straight through that thirty day moving average. That moving average went from green to red back-to-back -back days. Remember, that's fairly rare. It can happen, but usually you have a yellow transition in between, kind of like what you saw up here with industrials, where you went green, yellow, red. In the case of the consumer staples down below, you went from green to red in one single day because of how aggressive today's candle was. So, um, you know, if you're a, a trader focused on relative strength, that's not really going to do you any favors there in the consumer staples. If you're a long-term investor looking for opportunities to buy stocks at cheaper prices than where they were just yesterday, then perhaps there's an opportunity there for you. But as you can see, the vast majority of these charts are now trading below their 30-day moving averages. The only exceptions to that are technology that I mentioned before and discretionary that I mentioned before. And that's largely because of Apple and Tesla. Uh, all of the other charts are now trading below their 30-day moving averages in addition to having uh, either weekly or strongly bearish postures according to the market forecast technical indicator. So it was an ugly day today almost no matter where you were, were, were trying to hide out. Uh, it was bad in every single sector. So let's go ahead and get into our trade application example now. And as I mentioned earlier, on days like today, I like to go hunting for bombed out opportunities. You have to be a little bit brave to do it, admittedly, but um, if you're doing it with higher quality stocks, I think you can do it somewhat successfully. Whether today's ends up being successful or not is anybody's guess, but we do give ourselves plenty of wiggle room by the strategy that we implement as well. And today is one of those days when the VIX explodes higher, stock prices explode lower. I like to go and look for selling puts on high quality stocks. So let me show you what I came up with here today. Now keep in mind the trade was already done when the stock market was in session and I've already sent out the, uh, the, the, the screenshots of the execution prices and all of that within our Telegram uh, trade alerts uh, system that we use for our premium members. So feel free to check that out if you are a premium member. Um, and that way you can be notified during the trading day when David and I are placing our trades. But in the case of what I did for our trade application example here, uh, it was on Bristol Myers. 
Now, Bristol Myers is a well-known, you know, healthcare slash pharmaceutical company here, um, both in the United States and worldwide. Um, and it might not have the press of your kind of Mercs and your Pfizer's that have been in the press a little bit more with the coronavirus stuff more recently. It doesn't have the splashiness of something like Moderna either. So it's been kind of a, in a quieter corner of healthcare. But I've noticed it's really started to, to kind of give back gains here tremendously over the last two or three months or so. You can see that just a few months ago, it was up here at $70 per share. Here we are just a couple of months later and we're at $53 per share. Now notice that Bristol Myers is now giving us back-to-back -back weeks where we have these green dots showing up on the chart. Those are what are known as oversold cluster signals. And this chart that we're using right here is a weekly candle chart. You can always see that in the upper left-hand corner. It says 10 Y for year, uh, meaning this is 10 years in length that we're looking at here, but each one of the bars is represented by this W or weekly, right? It's not a D for day or it's not an M for month, it's a W for weekly. So the point being, when you get these oversold cluster signals, they are more rare on weekly candle charts than they are on daily candle charts, which is also why I mentioned earlier that monthly candle charts are even more rare than the weekly candle charts. And we actually have three stocks, not Bristol Myers, but three other stocks in the S&P 500 that have uh, monthly clusters that I'll share with you in tonight's email. Anyway, when we're looking at Bristol Myers, you'll notice that as it has fallen from $70 all the way down here to 53, it's starting to approach this blue line down here that's at right around $50.26. Now what that represents is an area that us dividend growth investors feel like Bristol Myers would be a good selection for a long-term portfolio. The way that that blue line is generated is it's looking at previous high yields throughout history and then averaging that out and then plotting it on a chart. So as you can see, about nine or 10 years ago, it was trading down in that blue zone back then as well. And of course, that would have been a great time to be buying Bristol Myers Squibb as it was around 30 to $35 and has had a decent run over time. Of course, keep in mind, this is a stock that has raised its dividends every single one of those 10 years along the way. And that's kind of the, the the secret weapon or the, the hidden aspect of this trade as well. We talked about this one as a matter of fact in my question and answer session a couple of weeks ago. And one thing I pointed out at that time is Bristol Myers has already raised its dividends uh, or I should say has, has already paid its current dividend for four quarters. So notice down here it says 49 cents, 49 cents, 49 cents, 49 cents. This is a company that has a pattern, like a lot of companies, that after paying the exact same rate for four quarters, the next announcement is likely to be a dividend increase. At that time, this blue portion of the chart will jut up again, just like it did back here, and back here, and back here, and so on and so forth. You can see at the end of the year, right next to those gray dashes is, is the year rollover line, um, Bristol Myers tends to make an announcement that they're going to increase their dividend. So in other words, this situation right here is even better than it looks like at first blush because in all likelihood, within about a month's worth of time, this blue line is gonna jut higher and we might already be trading in the blue line right here. So what I ended up doing was selling a $47 January put. I was able to get a well over 1% return on risk for doing that. And as you can see here, if you were to do uh, the 47 uh, strike, you're well, you're deep within that blue zone, meaning that the current 3.65% dividend yield that you see up here um, would be well above 3.9%, which is where that blue zone starts right there. In fact, you're probably above a 4% dividend yield. And again, that's based upon the current rate, which in all likelihood is gonna be going higher here in one month when they make that announcement. But even if you were not going to do that and you were gonna be very conservative with your calculation, you know, you could take the 0.49% uh, current dividend amount, take that times four to annualize it, and then divide that number by your strike price of 47. You could even take the premium out of that. We got over 50 cents for doing that. So let's just make the math easy and say that our, our, um, our, our cost basis would end up being 46.50 on that trade. You can see that the, the yield that we would start off with would be 4.21% yield 
well above the 3.65% dividend yield of today and well above its average extreme highs throughout history that tend to round out to about 3.9%. So I'm kind of intrigued with this one. I think it's a pretty interesting setup. Yes, you have to be brave because the stock market got hammered today. The stock was down with the rest of the market, although not tremendously. It was only down 1.8%, so it slightly outperformed the market. But it's been down a little bit more aggressively in recent weeks, to be fair. But the point being, we're approaching that very interesting level for long-term investing, teaming that up with an oversold weekly cluster here, teaming that up with the likelihood of Bristol Myers likely announcing a dividend increase in one month's worth of time. All of those things taken together make this a very interesting trade setup. So uh, hopefully you got value out of that presentation tonight. We went a little bit longer than we normally would, right? Normally I'm not going to give you 48 or 49 minutes or whatever it's been here, but today was a wild day. And so uh, wanted to kind of make up for lost time a little bit there to a degree and make sure we review a lot of different information. So if you got value out of my presentation tonight, remember, I'm not asking you to pay me any money. Um, we work for free for you on these YouTube videos. All I ask out of you is just simply help support uh, this presentation by clicking like there for us on Twitter. As long as we're up and over 100 likes, I will make sure it's a priority to get the video done on Thursday as well. If we're below 100 likes, then I'll just have to see what my schedule looks like at that time. So uh, with that, I want to wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Remember, uh, just a few more hours on our Black Friday sale for those of you that want to take advantage of that as well. So all the best wishes to you, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.